Archaeological evidence reveals a close relationship between people and the spiritual world dating back as far as the Bronze Age, if not earlier, and this relationship is often enacted through water. So springs often reveal ritual deposits, such as those found at the head of the Seine. And it's unsurprising that humans would continue this water-based relationship via wells. After all, they're easy enough to go and visit, you would often know where the water actually comes from, and they end up accruing very much a place-based set of folklore. And for some scholars, Wells had either a patron deity or a guardian spirit, which was later replaced by a saint or angel. For example, there is a suggestion that the Celtic water goddess Alona became Saint Helen. But Wells took on multiple functions, used to heal, curse, make wishes and even divine for the future. And of course, people used them as a water source. So let's have a look at some of these wells across the British Isles in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are coming into March, and this is going to be the Folklore of Sacred Spaces in the Landscape Month, which is a little bit of a mouthful, but never mind. March is also my birthday month, as I think I've mentioned before, and I just thought I might as well mention it again. Who cares? So that's going to be interesting, because I have no idea what I'm doing for it yet, but there we go. So because we're looking at sacred places in the landscape, we are going to be having a look at things like stone circles, stand and stone barrows, that kind of thing. And I really wanted to start off with holy wells. I've had a bit of a fixation with water folklore for quite some time. And they are really interesting in the sense that there's just so many of them. Like at one point I was reading yesterday, there's something like over 3,000 of them in Ireland. There's about 2,000 of them in England. You know, there's a lot of these around the British Isles. Now, because of the fact that there's so many of them, I've got to find a way to narrow them down somehow. And because we're looking at places in the landscape, I'm not going to be covering wells in towns or cities. So I'm not going to be doing Glastonbury this time, but I'm going to be looking at urban wells in the future. So I will definitely have a look at Glastonbury at some point for that as well. I also am not covering well dressing as a tradition either because I've also got an exclusive article about that for Patreon supporters. So if you're interested, you can get access to that at like the lowest level of support, which is like a dollar a month or 75p. I think it works out as so we're not looking at well dressing either. But we are going to get started with the folklore of wells and we're going to start off with collecting well water. So obviously most wells would be local to the people who actually use them. But the locals didn't just use the water by paying a visit. So people might actually collect it to use it at home. Obviously, you would do that if you're using it for for drinking water. But we do see a modern version of this at the Petrifying Well at Mother Shipton's Cave in Nairsborough. And you can buy bottles of the water from the gift shop. And people often do in the hope that some of the magical ability of this alleged 16th century prophetess still lies in the water. I say alleged, there's a bonus episode about it. I'm not going to go into that too much now. But in North Devon, people actually collected water from Holy Wells on Ascension Day to enjoy its benefits throughout the rest of the year. And the first water drawn on New Year's Day was actually called the Flower of the Well and it brought a household good fortune. And it got its name because whoever got to the well first would then leave a flower in the well to let others know that somebody else had already collected the first water of the year. Now, if you collected the Flower of the Well from the Old Kirk Well, the Upper Well or the Riverside Well in Walk on Tyne in Northumberland, you apparently gained the ability to fly at night and pass through keyholes. So that would definitely be worth collecting. But I think in many cases, wells are probably most often thought of in connection with saints. And how people interacted with the well very much depended on its location and, in some cases, the saint. So Celeste Ray explains that when visiting an Irish holy well, the visitor would often walk clockwise around the well, they would repeat a specified number of prayers, and they might even leave an offering. Some wells have features in the landscape, like specific trees and boulders, and visitors would then put those into their circuit around the well, and they would pray at each of these features or stations in turn. And then once you've done all of that, you might drink from the water, use it to anoint parts of the body, particularly if you're using it for healing purposes, or you might flick the water around yourselves while naming the Trinity, or use it to make the sign of the cross. 
Now, as well as saints being patrons of wells, wells also have quite a lot of miraculous origin stories of water springing forth from the spot where a decapitated saint fell, such as St Sidwell in Exeter, where the saint was beheaded while in prayer. And the spring basically welled up on the spot where the head landed, supposedly with healing properties, but sadly the well is now lost. And in an even more gruesome story, Knights murdered St Thomas Becket in Canterbury Cathedral in 1170, and according to legend, locals then put his blood and brains in the cathedral well. There's an idea about the principle of transference, so if you put something holy into something else, it then makes that other thing holy as well. So by putting the blood and brains into the well, it turned the waters into a holy relic as well. And saints could also create healing springs by driving their staff into the ground. And Sir John Sean, an unofficial saint it must be said, and rector at North Marston in Buckinghamshire apparently did exactly that and a spring gushed forth on the spot. In this case the waters worked best to cure toothache or gout and you can still visit the spring today because I think somewhat recently they did actually kind of do like a nice restoration of the surroundings of the well and it looks really cool. And I had to put a local example in, obviously, but apparently parents dipped sickly children into St Bede's well near Jarrow, and that is Bede as in the Venerable Bede, before dropping a crooked pin into the well as payment. And according to legend, the young St Bede had actually discovered the well and he preached there. So he didn't create it, but he became associated with it by preaching there. Now, no one actually knows for definite if he ever visited the well in reality, but locals certainly believed in its power to cure the sick. What would be really nice is if that particular well could also be likewise restored because it's basically just been surrounded by industry over the years and it would be nice if people could actually see it given how important bead is to the area. But wells didn't only rely on saints for their healing properties. Some wells derived their healing powers from a guardian spirit and this gave rise to the practice of the Clouty tree. And I've sort of mentioned these briefly before but they were usually hawthorns that stood over or beside a well. And the accepted practice is to tear a length of fabric from your clothing, ideally the clothing touching the afflicted body part which creates the clouty. You would dip that fabric into the well which is then seeking the aid of the well spirit and you would hang it over a branch or impale it on one of the tree's thorns. As the rag rotted so your ailment would reduce and if anyone removed the clouty the ailment would then transfer to them. Now in some places the patient would recite a charm while they were doing all of this whereas patrons in Madron in Cornwall had to do the whole thing in total silence to achieve success. People have visited the Clutie Well at Munlochy on the Black Isle and the Highlands since at least 620 AD, and at this time the well was linked with St Boniface, but its uses as Clutie Well superseded this link. Patients would visit the well, circle it clockwise three times, splash water on the ground and pray before tying their rag to the tree. One of the things that has created a problem with clouty trees is that people seem to think that the cloth is an offering and that they're somehow going to get their wish granted by the well spirit, which makes absolutely no sense. So people have a really annoying tendency of leaving non-biodegradable fabrics that damage the tree. So I'm not quite sure why they think a water spirit would want to grant their wish in exchange for a ragged strip of polyester. But if you do want to get the most out of a clouty well, then the fabric needs to be able to rot. That is literally the point of it. So undyed linen is a good option for that. And it, as I say, I've seen photos where people have hung all sorts of rubbish off clouty trees. And I'm sorry, I don't really see how you think an underwire bra is going to actually achieve what a clouty well is supposed to do. So no, the fabric is not an offering. It's part of the actual process. But one alternative to the clouty was also the charm bag. So a patient might make a charm bag containing various different ingredients, but there would also be something from their body, like a lock of hair or nail clippings. And this is basically a form of sympathetic magic. So they would then leave the bag at the well. And because it contained part of them, obviously in the form of the hair or nail clippings, it would then mean that part of their spirit would be left at the well as well. So their spirit would then be enjoying the healing influence of the well and then that would transfer to the person without them actually needing to be physically present, which is quite cool. But obviously healing is like the primary function of a lot of the holy wells and how you access that healing varied. You might drink the water, anoint the afflicted body part with water or you might just simply make an offering to the well spirit or saint. And again, people often took the well water home to continue their cure over the following days. Now in Scotland, people believe the wells were most potent on the first Sundays of November, February, May and August. 
And in other cases, if you were going to go and collect water from the well, you couldn't put that container of water down until you got home. In other places, you couldn't tell anyone that you'd gone to the well, otherwise it would make it not work. And also, you would take one route to get to the well, and then you would follow a completely different route home as well. It was also important not to offend the well spirit, and you could offend them by washing clothes or animals in the well, or felling any trees by the well. Which is why I thought it was a really interesting story when we were looking at alder a couple of weeks ago, and the fact that the guy is sort of cutting down alder branches, and it's an alder beside a well. I'm kind of like, that's a bit of a no-no, but never mind. Because if offended, the well spirit might withdraw its powers. So according to legend, Erasmus Pasco, the Sheffield of Cornwall, bathed his dog in the well of St. Philac in 1720 and a curse befell his family. Irish wells might actually migrate altogether if they took offence at human behaviour. They might do this again if someone washed dirty clothes or feet in the well, if you let dogs drink from them or if you washed farm animals in them or if you just simply try to fill the well in as well. And in some stories, a well that was filled in might re-emerge in the house of whoever had filled it in. In 1938, the spirit at the eye well at Ballymena in County Antrim apparently fled when someone tried to heal a horse at the well. Now, obviously, this did depend on the well, it should be noted. Now, St John's Well in Harpen provided cures for humans and livestock alike, much like the healing spot at Bath, where, according to legend, the Celtic prince Bladud was badly affected by leprosy and was forced to live as a swineherd, and he actually passed his affliction on to his pigs. One day he took them a drink from Sulis' spring in Bath and they were healed. So Bladud likewise bathed in the water and was also cured. Although I do want to just include this one little tiny bit because healing wasn't only available to humans or animals because on stormy days, islanders on Inishmurry in County Sligo would drain the well of assistance and doing so would calm the sea. And elsewhere in Ireland, sailors would take clay from particular holy wells to protect them from being shipwrecked. Now, some wells also offered a form of divination for you to know if your healing work would be successful, which is good. So two sacred fish lived in St. Paris's well near Clan Berris and people would either bathe the afflicted limb in the water or they would drink it. If the fish appeared, it meant that the person would be cured. If the fish stayed hidden, the ailment would remain. And fish also appear at other wells as well because people have long celebrated the Loch Shianta Spring on Sky for its healing abilities the patient would drink the water and circle the spring clockwise three times before leaving an offering of clothing, pins, coins or coloured threads. There was actually a sacred trout in the loch nearby which people considered to be the well's guardian so people actually wouldn't fish there. So is there a scientific reason behind the healing properties of these wells? Well, it's not quite a healing well but just to find out if this is the case we might turn to the Sanskrit well also known as the Well of Chapel Downs in Cornwall where the local vicar actually rediscovered it in 1879. Now, because it was lost for so long, there's basically not that much folklore associated with it. But visitors report experiencing trance states and visions in the well, so is it a coincidence that the water is recorded as giving a radiation count some 200% higher than background levels? I'll leave that one up to you to decide. But I think many of us probably come into contact with wells through the existence of wishing wells and people would obviously visit them to make an offering in the hope that their wish would be granted. Obviously think about all those times when you've been past a fountain in a shopping centre and people have been chucking in money to try and have a wish granted. It's the same principle. So at the well of St John at Mount Grace Priory in North Yorkshire, people would stick a pin through an ivy leaf before floating it on the water to make their wish. Any leaves that floated meant the wish would come true and leaves that sank meant the wish would go ungranted. The fact they're using an ivy leaf I think is quite clever because obviously it's an evergreen so at least you're not restricted to a particular time of year to be able to do this. And it's really annoying because I've been to Mount Grace Priory and I've seen the well but I didn't actually cotton on what it was otherwise I would absolutely have tried that to see if it worked because you know what I'm like. People at St Anne's Well in Chelech in Monmouthshire offered a pebble with their wish. So if lots of bubbles appeared when they dropped the pebble into the water, then their wish would be granted. If they got a few bubbles, it would be granted, but after a delay. But if there was no bubbles, then their wish was denied. In the north of England, passers-by might breathe their wish as they passed a wishing well. And only by dropping a crooked pin into the well could you be assured that your wish would come true. And 19th century folklorist William Henderson listed the worm well at Lambton another at Westmoreland and a third at Wooler as being wells where you could do this. And yes, that would be the same well in Lambton where John Lambton threw the worm that he'd hooked from the river, which gave rise to the legend of the Lambton worm. 
Henderson also notes that country girls believe the pin made a convenient offering for the fairy or spirit presiding over the well because obviously everybody would have access to pins at the time. And I did also cover a specific pin well in the Cheviot episode. But sometimes the offering was more convoluted than dropping a pin into the water. So one tradition about Egelwys Farewell in Clean in Wales said that a beautiful woman once had an important wish. And Marie Trevelyan relates the story, so again, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. She doesn't say when this was, it was just a long time ago. But anyway, this woman had a wish she wanted to make, and a strange woman visited her one day at sunset, telling her she would get a wish if she went down to the well, filled her mouth with water came back up from the well and then walked a circuit around the church without spilling a drop of water. Now, the story doesn't say if she actually managed it, but Marie Trevelyan does claim that young people continue to try the ritual to get their wishes granted. And people could also use wells for cursing, because cursing and wishing are kind of two sides of the same coin. And they would do this by dropping tablets inscribed with their victim's name or wax effigies of their victim into the water. Similar practices occurred with the waters of Bath using lead scrolls inscribed with the name of the intended victim. And people have sometimes recovered similar lead scrolls from the wells. Now, the way this kind of works is really interesting because at some wells, the well guardian would write the victim's name in a book before they were cursed. And if the victim suspected that they'd been cursed, they could actually go to the well guardian to find out if their name was in the book for a fee, obviously. Sometimes draining the well so the victim could find and then destroy the scroll or the piece of slate bearing their name was the best way to break the curse. Now, Marie Trevelyan offers two stories about St. Eliam's well, and in one, a woman made a clay figure and stuck pins in its heart. She took it to the well, convinced that her husband was unfaithful, and then added his name to the well guardian's book. She lowered the figure into the water where it stayed for a week, and during this whole period, her husband apparently suffered from heart pains. After a week, she pulled up the figure and moved the pins from the heart to the head. And she basically did this with different body parts across the course of a few months. And the man finally changed his behaviour. Having done so, the wife forgave him. And I'm assuming she took the pins out of the figure. The same well was also used for cursing purposes where a man went along and suspended a wax image of his uncle over the well. He stuck pins into it and tied it to a piece of copper. And he cursed his uncle with pain, loss of money and loss of property. So the man plunged the figure into the well three times before letting it rest at the bottom. The uncle finally promised the share of money that was owed to him and the man removed the figure and the curse. And if we believe the story, during the time all this was happening, the uncle was robbed, he suffered physical pain and he also lost property to fire. And while it's not quite cursing, I thought I'd include this one anyway, people in Clan Bedrog could use the well to discover if they'd been robbed. They would kneel at the side of the well and run through a list of names, both suspects in the theft and acquaintances alike, and they would toss little pieces of bread into the water with each name, and the bread would sink when they reached the thief. If, however, they got to the end and the bread floated and none of it had sank, and it just basically disintegrated instead, then they would never discover who the thief was. So ultimately, what do we make of the folklore of wells? Well, heading to a well in search of healing might sound nonsensical to some people, but in earlier centuries, to be fair, you might have been just as likely to find relief from bathing at a holy well as from practising some other form of cure. And given the benefits of hydrotherapy, I can't help thinking that for some afflictions, simply being around water would probably help to boost the mood or alleviate stress, which would potentially have a knock-on effect on physical symptoms. And it is also important to note as well, that those using wells for medicinal reasons understood that their actions might not work if we look at the range of divinations to see if the work would succeed. So they were already aware that it might not actually happen for them. So I think, again, you don't have to assume that these people were naive and thought that it would be a done deal that they would be cured. So I think we do have to bear that bit in mind. And I think in some cases, because a lot of these wells have been lost now or they've been covered over or we just simply don't know where they were in the first place, I think that well folklore is probably more likely to live on through that innate desire to throw a penny into a shopping centre fountain. And I think in popular culture in general, particularly in the British Isles, wells have kind of lost a lot of the magical allure and instead they become somewhere to deposit that which is unwanted. So we could look at like the Lambton worm where... Obviously, the, the the small worm that's hooked from the weir is thrown in there. And obviously, if anyone's familiar with horror cinema, obviously, if we look to the Japanese Ringu or indeed its remake from 2002 in America, the well became somewhere to deposit that which you no longer wanted. And also think about the, oh, no, has Timmy fallen down the well kind of things that you get from stuff like Lassie. Again, there's this idea of wells being somewhere where you put stuff you don't want rather than them being used for anything else, because a lot of the wells we think of 
are more like drinking wells where they've got that long shaft and you, you just simply put a bucket down it rather than them being these holy wells which look very different. But there again, even the traditional healing spas so beloved by previous generations aren't always necessarily as popular as they used to be. But I do think that while most wells are associated with saints, I do actually have to wonder how the original guardian spirits feel about this abandonment or if they're actually enjoying the peace and quiet. Who knows? So what I want to know is, have you ever made a wish at a well and it's come true? That's the bit I'm more interested in. Not to bother if it didn't. Have you ever actually had it work? Have you been to any of the healing wells? Have you had any luck with a clouty tree? Are there any wells near you? Please do feel free to let me know because it's always quite interesting to see how this folklore actually kind of spans out into like lived experience and so on like that. Our next sacred place in the landscape is going to be standing stones. I am drawing a distinction between standing stones and stone circles in that standing stones are literally that, but they're not in a circular formation. That's how I'm dividing them up because there's too many stories otherwise. So we'll have a look at standing stones next week. And yeah, I hope you enjoy your week ahead and I will see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.